Chapter Eleven of By What Authority by Robert Hugh Benson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Master Calvin. Isabel reached Northampton a day or two before Hubert came back to Great Keynes. She travelled down with two combined parties going to Leicester and Nottingham, sleeping at Leighton Buzzard on the way, and on the evening of the second day reached the house of her father's friend, Dr. Carrington, that stood in the market square. Her father's intention of sending her to this particular town and household was to show her how Puritanism, when carried to its extreme, was as orderly and disciplined a system, and was able to control the lives of its adherents, as well as the Catholicism whose influence on her character he found himself beginning to fear. But he wished also that she should be repelled to some extent by the merciless rigidity she would find at Northampton, and thus, after an oscillation or two, come to rest in the quiet eclecticism of that middle position which he occupied himself. The town, indeed, was at this time a miniature Geneva. There was something in the temper of its inhabitants that made it especially susceptible to the wave of Puritanism that was sweeping over England. Lollardy had flourished among them so far back as the reign of Richard the Second, when the mayor, as folks told one another with pride, had plucked a mass priest by the vestment on the way to the altar in All Saints Church, and had made him give over his mummery till the preacher had finished his sermon. Dr. Carrington, too, a clean-shaven, blue-eyed, gray-haired man, churchwarden of St. Sepulchre's, was a representative of the straightest views, and desperately in earnest. For him the world ranged itself into the redeemed and the damned. These two companies were the pivots of life for him, and every subject of mind or desire was significant only so far as it bore relations to the immutable decrees of God. But his fierce and merciless theological insistence was disguised by a real human tenderness and a marked courtesy of manner, and Isabel found him a kindly and thoughtful host. Yet the mechanical strictness of the household, and the overpowering sense of the weightiness of life that it conveyed, was a revelation to Isabel. Dr. Carrington at family prayers was a tremendous figure, as he kneeled upright at the head of the table in the somber dining-room, and it seemed to Isabel in her place that the pitiless, all-seeing presence that kept such terrifying silence as the doctor cried on Jehovah was almost a different God to that which she knew in the morning parlor at home, to whom her father prayed with more familiarity, but no less romance, and who answered in the sunshine that lay on the carpet, and the shadows of boughs that moved across it, and the chirp of the birds under the eaves. And all day long she thought she noticed the same difference. At Great Keynes life was made up of many parts, the love of family, the country doings, the worship of God, the garden, and the company of the hall ladies, and the presence of God interpenetrated all, like light or fragrance. But here life was lived under the glare of his eye and absorption in any detail apart from the consciousness of that encompassing presence had the nature of sin on the saturday after her arrival as she was walking by the nen with kate carrington one of the two girls she asked her about the crowd of ministers she had seen in the streets that morning they have been to the prophesyings said kate my father says that there is no exercise that sanctifies a godly young minister so quickly Kate went on to describe them further. The ministers assembled each Saturday at nine o'clock, and one of their number gave a short Bible reading or lecture. Then all present were invited to join in the discussion. The less instructed would ask questions, the more experienced would answer, and debate would run high. Such a method, Kate explained, who herself was a zealous and well-instructed Calvinist, was the surest and swiftest road to truth for every one held the open scriptures in his hand, and interpreted, and checked the speakers by the aid of that infallible guide. But if a man's judgment lead him wrong, 
asked isabel who professedly admitted authority to have some place in matters of faith all must hold the apostles creed first of all said kate and must set his name to a paper declaring the pope to be antichrist with other truths upon it isabel was puzzled for it seemed now as if private judgment were not supreme among its professors but she did not care to question further it began to dawn upon her presently however why the queen was so fierce against prophesyings for she saw that they exercised that spirit of exclusiveness the property of papist and puritan alike which since it was the antithesis of the tolerant comprehensiveness of the church of england was also the enemy of the theological peace that elizabeth was seeking to impose upon the country and that it was for that reason that papist and puritan sundered so far in theology were united in suffering for conscience sake on the sunday morning isabel went with mrs carrington and the two girls to the round templars church of st sepulchre for the morning prayer at eight o'clock and then on to st peter's for the sermon it was the latter function that was important in puritan eyes for the word preached was considered to have an almost sacramental force in the application of truth and grace to the soul and crowds of people with downcast eyes and in sombre dress were pouring down the narrow streets from all the churches round while the great bell beat out its summons from the norman tower the church was filled from end to end as they came in meeting dr carrington at the door and they all passed up together to the pew reserved for the churchwarden close beneath the pulpit as isabel looked round her it came upon her very forcibly what she had begun to notice even at great Keynes, that the religion preached there did not fit the church in which it was set forth and that though great efforts had been made to conform the building to the worship there had been no half measures at northampton for the puritans had a loathing of what they called a mingle mangle altars footpaces and pachine had been swept away and all marks of them removed as well as the rude loft and every image in the building the stained windows had been replaced by plain glass painted white the walls had been whitewashed from roof to floor and every suspicion of color erased except where texts of scripture ran rigidly across the open wall spaces we are not under the law but under grace isabel read opposite her beneath the clear story windows and above all the point to which all lines and eyes converged was occupied no longer by the table but by the tribunal of the lord yet underneath the disguise the old religion triumphed still beneath the great plain orderly scheme without depth of shadows dominated by the towering place of proclamation where the crimson-faced herald waited to begin the round arches and the elaborate mouldings and the cool depths beyond the pillars all declared that in the god for whom that temple was built there was mystery as well as revelation love as well as justice condescension as well as majesty beauty as well as awfulness invitations as well as eternal decrees isabella looked up presently as the people still streamed in and watched the minister in his rustling genevan gown leaning with his elbows on the bible that rested open on the great tasseled velvet cushion before him everything about him was on the grand scale his great hands were clasped and protruded over the edge of the book and his heavy dark face looked menacingly round on the crowded church he had the air of a melancholy giant about to engage in some tragic pleasure but isabel's instinctive dislike began to pass into positive terror so soon as he began to preach when the last comers had found a place and the talking had stopped he presently gave out his text in a slow thunderous voice that silenced the last whispers what shall we then say to these things 
if god be on our side who can be against us there were a few slow sentences in a deep resonant voice uttering each syllable deliberately like the explosion of a far-off gun and in a minute or two he was in the thick of calvin's smoky gospel doctrine voice and man were alike terrible and overpowering there lay the great scheme in a few minutes seen by isabel as though through the door of hell illumined by the glare of the eternal embers the huge merciless will of god stood there before her disclosed in all its awfulness armed with thunders moving on mighty wheels the foreknowledge of god closed the question henceforth and if proof were needed made predestination plain there was man's destiny irrevocably fixed iron bound changeless and immovable as the laws of god's own being yet over the rigid and awful face of god flickered a faint light named mercy and this mercy vindicated its existence by demanding that some souls should escape the final and endless doom that was the due reward of every soul conceived and born in enmity against god and under the frown of his justice then heralded too by wrath the figure of jesus began to glimmer through the thunderclouds and isabel lifted her eyes to look in hope but he was not as she had known him in his graciousness and as he had revealed himself to her in tender communion and among the flowers and under the clear skies of sussex here in this echoing world of wrath he stood pale and rigid with lightning in his eyes and the grim and crimson cross behind him and as powerless as his own father himself to save one poor timid despairing hoping soul against whom the eternal decree had gone forth jesus was stern and forbidding here with the red glare of wrath on his face too instead of the rosy crown of love upon his forehead his mouth was closed with compressed lips which surely would only open to condemn not that mouth quivering and human that had smiled and trembled and bent down from the cross to kiss poor souls that could not hope nor help themselves that had smiled upon isabel ever since she had known him it was appalling to this gentle maiden soul that had bloomed and rejoiced so long in the shadow of his healing to be torn out of her retreat and set thus under the consuming noonday of the justice of this sun of white-hot righteousness for as she listened it was all so miserably convincing her own little essays of intellect and flights of hopeful imagination were caught up and whirled away in the strong rush of this man's argument her timid expectancy that god was really love as she understood the word in the vision of her saviour's person this was dashed aside as a childish fancy the vision of the father of the everlasting arms receded into the realm of dreams and instead there lowered overhead in this furious tempest of wrath a monstrous god with a stony face and a stonier heart who was eternally either her torment or salvation and isabel thought and trembled at the blasphemy that if god were such as this the one would be no less agony than the other was this man bearing false witness not only against his neighbor but far more awfully against his god but it was too convincing it was built up on an iron-hammered framework of a great man's intellect and made white-hot with another great man's burning eloquence but it seemed to isabel now and again as if a thunder-voiced virile devil were proclaiming the gospel of everlasting shame 
there he bent over the pulpit with flaming face and great compelling gestures that swayed the congregation eliciting the emotions he desired as the conductor's baton draws out the music for the man was a great orator and he stormed and roared and seemed to marshal the very powers of the world to come compelling them by his nod and interpreting them by his voice and below him sat this poor child tossed along on his eloquence like a straw on a flood and yet hating and resenting it and struggling to detach herself and disbelieve every word he spoke as the last sands were running out in his hourglass he came to harbour from this raging sea and in a few deep resonant sentences like those with which he began he pictured the peace of the ransomed soul that knows itself safe in the arms of god that rejoices even in this world in the light of his face and the ecstasy of his embrace that dwells by waters of comfort and lies down in the green pastures of the heavenly love while round this little island of salvation in an ocean of terror the thunders of wrath sound only as the noise of surge on a far-off reef the effect on isabel was very great it was far more startling than her visit to london there her quiet religion had received high sanction in the mystery of st paul's but here it was the plainest calvinism preached with immense power the preacher's last words of peace were no peace to her if it was necessary to pass those bellowing breakers of wrath to reach the happy country then she had never reached it yet she had lived so far in an illusion her life had been spent in a fool's paradise where the light and warmth and flowers were but artificial after all and she knew that she had not the heart to set out again though she recognized dimly the compelling power of this religion and that it was one which if sincerely embraced would make the smallest details of life momentous with eternal weight yet she knew that her soul could never respond to it and whether saved or damned that it could only cower in miserable despair under a deity that was so sovereign as this so her heart was low and her eyes sad as she followed mrs carrington out of church was this then really the revelation of the love of god in the person of jesus christ had all that she knew as the gospel melted down into this fiery lump the rest of the day did not alter the impression made on her mind there was little talk or evidence of any human fellowship in the carrington household on the lord's day there was a word or two of grave commendation on the sermon during dinner and in the afternoon there was the evening prayer to be attended in st sepulchre's followed by an exposition and a public catechizing on calvin's questions and answers here the same awful doctrines reappeared condensed with an icy reality even more paralyzing than the burning presentation of them in the morning sermon she was spared questions herself as she was a stranger and sat to hear girls of her own age and older men and women who looked as soft-hearted as herself utter definitions of the method of salvation and the being and character of god that compelled the assent of her intellect while they jarred with her spiritual experience as fiercely as brazen trumpets out of tune in the evening there followed further religious exercises in the dark dining-room at the close of which dr carrington read one of mr calvin's genevan discourses from his tall chair at the head of the table she looked at him at first and wondered in her heart whether that man with his clear gentle voice and his pleasant old face crowned with iron-gray hair seen in the mellow candlelight really 
believed in the terrible gospel of the morning for she heard nothing of the academic discourse that he was reading now and presently her eyes wandered away out of the windows to the pale night sky there still glimmered a faint streak of light in the west across the market square it seemed to her as a kind of mirror of her soul at this moment the tender daylight had faded though she could still discern the token of its presence far away and as from behind the bars of a cage but the night of god's wrath was fast blotting out the last touch of radiance from her despairing soul dr carrington looked at her with courteous anxiety but with approval too as he held her hand for a moment as she said good night to him there were shadows of weariness and depression under her eyes and the corners of her mouth drooped a little and the doctor's heart stirred with hope that the word of god had reached at last this lamb of his who had been fed too long on milk and sheltered from the sun but who was now coming out driven it might be and unhappy but still on its way to the plain and wholesome pastures of the word that lay in the glow of the unveiled glory of god isabel in her dark room upstairs was miserable she stood long at her window her face pressed against the glass and looked at the sky from which the last streak of light had now died and longed with all her might for her own oak room at home with her pre and the familiar things about her and the pines rustling outside and the sweet night wind it seemed to her as if an irresistible hand had plucked her out from those loved things and places and that a penetrating eye were examining every corner of her soul in one sense she believed herself nearer to god than ever before but it was heartbreaking to find him like this she went to sleep with the same sense of a burdening presence resting on her spirit the next morning dr carrington saw her privately and explained to her a notice that she had not understood when it had been given out in church the day before it was to the effect that the quarterly communion would be administered on the following sunday having been transferred that year from the sunday after michaelmas day and that she must hold herself in readiness on the wednesday afternoon to undergo the examination that was enforced in every household in northampton at the hands of the minister and church wardens but you need not fear it mistress norris he said kindly seeing her alarm my daughter kate will tell you all that is needful kate too told her that it would be little more than formal in her case the minister will not ask you much she said for you are a stranger and my father will vouch for you he will ask you of irresistible grace and of the sacrament and she gave her a couple of books from which she might summarize the answers especially directing her attention to calvin's catechism telling her that that was the book with which all the servants and apprentices were obliged to be familiar when wednesday afternoon came one by one the members of the household went before the inquisition that held its court in the dining-room and last of all isabel's turn came the three gentlemen who sat in the middle of the long side of the table with their backs to the light half rose and bowed to her as she entered and requested her to sit opposite to them to her relief it was the minister of st sepulchre's who was to examine her he who had read the service and discoursed on the catechism not the morning preacher he was a man who seemed a little ill at ease himself he had none of the superb confidence of the preacher but appeared to be one to whose natural character this stern role was not altogether congenial he asked a few very simple questions as to when she had last taken the sacrament how she would interpret the words this is my body and looked almost grateful when she answered quietly and without heat he asked her too three or four of the simpler questions which kate had indicated to her all of which she answered satisfactorily and then desired to know whether she was 
in charity with all men and whether she looked to jesus christ alone as her one saviour finally he turned to dr carrington and wished to know whether mistress norris would come to the sacrament at five or nine o'clock and dr carrington answered that she would no doubt wish to come with his own wife and daughters at nine o'clock which was the hour for the folks who were better to do and so the inquisition ended much to isabel's relief but this was a very extraordinary experience to her it gave her a first glimpse into the rigid discipline that the extreme puritans wished to see enforced everywhere and with it a sense of corporate responsibility that she had not appreciated before the congregation meant something to her now she was no longer alone with her lord individually but understood that she was part of a body with various functions and that the care of her soul was not merely a personal matter for herself but involved her minister and the officers of the church as well it astonished her to think that this process was carried out on every individual who lived in the town in preparation for the sacrament on the following sunday isabel and indeed the whole household spent the friday and saturday in rigid and severe preparation no flesh food was eaten on either of the days and all the members of the family were supposed to spend several hours in their own rooms in prayer and meditation she did not find this difficult as she was well practised in solitude and prayer and she scarcely left her rooms all saturday except for meals o oh lord isabel repeated each morning and evening at her bedside during this week the blind dullness of our corrupt nature will not suffer us sufficiently to waive these thy most ample benefits yet nevertheless at the commandment of jesus christ our lord we present ourselves to this his table which he hath left to be used in remembrance of his death until his coming again to declare and witness before the world that by him alone we have received liberty and life and that by him alone dost thou acknowledge us to be thy children and heirs that by him alone we have entrance to the throne of thy grace that by him alone we are possessed in our spiritual kingdom to eat and drink at his table with whom we have our conversation presently in heaven and by whom our bodies shall be raised up again from the dust and shall be placed with him in that endless joy which thou o father of mercy hast prepared for thine elect before the foundation of the world was laid and so she prepared herself for that tryst with her beloved in a foreign land where all was strange and unfamiliar about her yet he was hourly drawing nearer and she cried to him day by day in these words so redolent to her with associations of past communions and of moments of great spiritual elevation the very use of the prayer this week was like a breeze of flowers to one in a wilderness on the saturday night she ceremoniously washed her feet as her father had taught her and lay down happier than she had been for days past for to-morrow would bring the lover of her soul on the sunday all the household was astir early at their prayers and about half-past eight o'clock all including the servants who had just returned from the five o'clock service assembled in the dining-room the noise of the feet of those returning from church had ceased on the pavement of the square outside and all was quiet except for the solemn sound of the bells as dr carrington offered extempore prayer for all who were fulfilling the lord's ordinance on that day and isabel once more felt her heart yearn to a god who seemed love after all st sepulchre's was nearly full when they arrived the mahogany table had been brought down from the eastern wall to beneath the cupola and stood there with a large white cloth descending almost to the ground on every side and a row of silver vessels flat plates and tall new communion cups and flagons shone upon it isabel buried her face in her hands and tried to withdraw into the solitude of her own soul but the noise of the feet coming and going and the talking on all sides of her were terribly distracting presently four ministers entered and isabel was startled to see as she raised her face at the sudden silence that none of them wore the prescribed surplice 
for she had not been accustomed to the views of the extreme puritans to whom this was a remnant of popery an indifferent thing indeed in itself as they so often maintained but far from indifferent when it was imposed by authority one entered the pulpit the other three took their places at the holy table and after a metrical psalm sung in the genevan fashion the service began at the proper place the minister in the pulpit delivered an hour's sermon of the type to which isabel was being now introduced for the first time but bearing again and again on the point that the sacrament was a confession to the world of faith in christ it was in no sense a sacrificial act towards god as the papists vainly taught this part of the sermon was spoiled to isabel's ears at least by a flood of disagreeable words poured out against the popish doctrine and the end of the sermon consisted of a searching exhortation to those who contemplated sin who bore malice who were in any way holding aloof from god to cast themselves mightily upon the love of the redeemer bewailing their sinful lives and purposing to amend them this act wrought out in the silence of the soul even now would transfer the sinner from death unto life and turn what threatened to be poison into a lively and healthful food then he turned to those who came prepared and repentant hungering and thirsting after the bread of life and the wine that the lord had mingled and congratulated them on their possession of grace and on the rich access of sanctification that would be theirs by a faithful reception of this comfortable sacrament and then in half a dozen concluding sentences he preached christ as food to the hungry a stream to the thirsty a rest for the weary it is he alone our dear redeemer who openeth the kingdom of heaven to which may he vouchsafe to bring us for his name's sake isabel was astonished to see that the preacher did not descend from the pulpit after the sermon but that as soon as he had announced that the mayor would sit at the town hall with the ministers and church wardens on the following thursday to inquire into the cases of all who had not presented themselves for communion he turned and began to busy himself with the great bible that lay on the cushion the service went on and the conducting of it was shared among the three ministers standing one at the centre of the table which was placed endways and the others at the two ends as the prayer of consecration was begun isabel hid her face as she was accustomed to do for she believed it to be the principal part of the service and waited for the silence that in her experience generally followed the amen but a voice immediately began from the pulpit and she looked up startled and distracted then jesus said unto them pealed out the preacher's voice all ye shall be offended by me this night for it is written i will smite the shepherd and the sheep shall be scattered but after i am risen i will go into galilee before you ah why would not the man stop isabel did not want the past saviour but the present now not a dead record but a living experience above all not the minister but the great high priest himself he began to be troubled and in great heaviness and said unto them my soul is very heavy even unto the death tarry here and watch the three ministers had communicated by now and there was a rustle and clatter of feet as the empty seats in front hung with houseling cloths began to be filled the murmur of the three voices below as the ministers passed along with the vessels were drowned by the tale of the passion that rang out overhead couldst thou not watch one hour watch and pray that ye enter not into temptation the spirit indeed is ready but the flesh is weak it was coming near to isabel's turn the carringtons already were beginning to move and in a moment or two she rose and followed them out the people were pressing up the aisles and as she stood waiting her turn to pass into the white-hung seat 
she could not help noticing the disorder that prevailed some knelt devoutly some stood some sat to receive the sacred elements and all the while louder and louder above the rustling and the loud whisperings of the ministers and the shuffling of feet the tale rose and fell on the cadences of the preacher's voice now it was her turn she was kneeling with palms outstretched and closed eyes ah would he not be silent for one moment could not the reality speak for itself and its interpreter be still surely the king of love needed no herald when himself was here and anon in the dawning the high priest held a council with elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound jesus and led him away and so it was over presently and she was back again in her seat distracted and miserable trying to pray forcing herself to attend now to the reader now to her saviour with whom she believed herself in intimate union and finding nothing but dryness and distraction everywhere how interminable it was she opened her eyes and what she saw amazed and absorbed her for a few moments some were sitting back and talking some looking cheerfully about them as if at a public entertainment one man especially overwhelmed her imagination with a great red face and a neck like a butcher animal and brutal with a heavy hanging jowl and little narrow lack-lustre eyes how bored and depressed he was by this long obligatory ceremony then once more she closed her eyes in self-reproach at her distractions here were her lips still fragrant with the wine of god the pressure of her beloved's arm still about her and these were her thoughts settling like flies on everything when she opened them again the last footsteps were passing down the aisle the dripping cups were being replaced by the ministers and covered with napkins and the tale of easter was in telling from the pulpit like the promise of a brighter day and they said one to another who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulchre and when they looked they saw that the stone was rolled away for it was a very great one so read the minister and closed the book and our father began in the evening when all was over and the prayers said and the expounding and catechizing finished in a kind of despair she slipped away alone and walked a little by herself in the deepening twilight beside the river and again she made effort after effort to catch some consciousness of grace from this sacrament sunday so rare and so precious but an oppression seemed to dwell in the very air the low rain clouds hung over the city leaden and chill the path where she walked was rank with the smell of dead leaves and the trees and grass dripped with lifeless moisture as she goaded and allured alternately her own fainting soul it writhed and struggled but could not rise there was no pungency of bitterness in her self-reproach no thrill of joy in her aspiration for the hand of calvin's god lay heavy on the delicate languid thing she walked back at last in despair over the wet cobblestones of the empty market square but as she came near the house she saw that the square was not quite empty a horse stood blowing and steaming before dr carrington's door and her own maid and kate were standing hatless in the doorway looking up and down the street isabel's heart began to beat and she walked quicker in a moment kate saw her and began to beckon and call and the maid ran to meet her mistress isabel mistress isabel she cried make haste what is it asked the girl in sick foreboding there is a man come from great keynes began the maid but kate stopped her come in mistress isabel she said my father is waiting for you dr carrington met her at the dining-room door and his face was tender and full of emotion what is it whispered the girl sharply anthony dear child he said come in and be brave 
there was a man standing in the room with cap and whip in hand spurred and splashed from head to foot isabel recognized one of the grooms from the hall what is it she said again with a piteous sharpness dr carrington laid his hands gently on her shoulders and looked into her eyes it is news of your father he said from lady maxwell he paused and the steady gleam of his eyes strengthened and quieted her then he went on deliberately the lord hath given and the lord hath taken it he paused as if for an answer but no answer came isabel was staring white-faced with parted lips into those strong blue eyes of his and he finished blessed be the name of the lord End of chapter 11chapter twelve of by what authority by robert hugh benson this librivox recording is in the public domain a winding up the curtained windows on the ground floor of the dower house shone red from within as isabel and dr carrington with three or four servants behind rode round the curving drive in front late on the monday evening a face peeped from mrs carroll's window as the horse's hoof sounded on the gravel and by the time that Isabel, pale, wet, and worn out with her seventy miles' ride, was dismounted, Mistress Margaret herself was at the door, with Anthony's face at her shoulder, and Mrs. Carroll looking over the banisters. Isabel was not allowed to see her father's body that night, but after she was in bed, Lady Maxwell herself, who had been sent for when he lay dying, came down from the hall and told her what there was to tell while mistress margaret and anthony entertained dr carrington below dear child said the old lady leaning with her elbow on the bed and holding the girl's hand tenderly as she talked it was all over in an hour or two it was the heart you know mrs carroll sends for me suddenly on saturday morning and by the time i reached him he could not speak they had carried him upstairs from his study where they had found him and laid him down on his bed and he, yes yes he was in pain but he was conscious and he was praying i think his lips moved and i knelt down by the bed and prayed aloud he only spoke twice and my dear it was your name the first time and the name of his saviour the second time he looked at me and i could see he was trying to speak and then on a sudden he spoke isabel and i think he was asking me to take care of you and i nodded and said that i would do what i could and he seemed satisfied and shut his eyes again and then presently mr bodder began a prayer he had come in a moment before they could not find him at first and then and then your dear father moved a little and raised his hand and the minister stayed and he was looking up as if he saw something and then he said once jesus clear and loud and and that was all dear child the next morning she and anthony with the two old ladies one of whom was always with them during these days went into the darkened oak room on the first floor where he had died and now rested the red curtains made a pleasant rosy light and it seemed to the children impossible to believe that that serene face scarcely more serene than in life with its wide closed lids under the delicate eyebrows and contented clean-cut mouth and the scholarly hands closed on the breast all in a wealth of autumn flowers and dark copper-coloured beech leaves were not the face and hands of a sleeping man but isabel did not utterly break down till she saw his study she drew the curtains aside herself and there stood his table his chair was beside it pushed back and sideways as if he had that moment left it 
and on the table itself the books she knew so well in the centre of the table stood his inlaid desk with the papers lying upon it and his quill beside them as if just laid down even the ink-pot was uncovered just as he had left it as the agony began to lay its hand upon his heart she stooped and read the last sentence this is the great fruit that unspeakable benefit that they do eat and drink of that labour and our burden and come and there it stopped and the blinding tears rushed into the girl's eyes as she stooped to kiss the curved knob of the chair arm where his dear hand had last rested when all was over a day or two later the two went up to stay at the hall while the housekeeper was left in charge of the dower house lady maxwell and mistress margaret had been present at the parish church on the occasion of the funeral for the first time ever since the old marian priest had left and had assisted too at the opening of the will which was found tied up and docketed in one of the inner drawers of the inlaid desk and before its instructions were complied with lady maxwell wished to have a word or two with isabel and anthony she made an opportunity on the morning of anthony's departure for cambridge two days after the funeral when mistress margaret was out of the room and hubert had ridden off as usual with peers on the affairs of the estate my child said she to isabel who was lying back passive and listless on the window-seat what do you think your cousin will direct to be done he will scarcely wish you to leave home altogether to stay with him and yet you understand he is your guardian isabel shook her head we know nothing of him she said wearily he has never been here if you have a suggestion to make to him you should decide at once the other went on the courier is to go on monday is he not anthony the boy nodded but will he not allow us he said to stay at home as usual surely lady maxwell shook her head and isabel she asked who will look after her when you are away mrs carroll he said interrogatively again she shook her head he would never consent she said it would not be right isabel looked up suddenly and her eyes brightened a little lady maxwell she began and then stopped embarrassed well my dear what is it isabel asked anthony if it were possible but but i could not ask it if you mean margaret my dear said the old lady serenely drawing her needle carefully through it was what i thought myself but i did not know if you would care for that is that what you meant oh lady maxwell said the girl her face lighting up then the old lady explained that it was not possible to ask them to live permanently at the hall although of course isabel must do so until an arrangement had been made because their father would scarcely have wished them to be actually inmates of a catholic house but that he plainly had encouraged close relations between the two houses and indeed lady maxwell interpreted his mention of his daughter's name and his look as he said it in the sense that he wished those relations to continue she thought therefore that there was no reason why their new guardian's consent should not be asked to mistress margaret's coming over to the dower house to take charge of isabel if the girl wished it he had no particular interest in them he lived a couple of hundred miles away and the arrangement would probably save him a great deal of trouble and inconvenience but you lady maxwell isabel burst out her face kindled with hope for she had dreaded the removal terribly you will be lonely here dear child said the old lady laying down her embroidery god has been gracious to me and my husband is coming back to me you need not fear for me 
and she told them with her old eyes full of happy tears how she had had a private word which they must not repeat from a catholic friend at court that all had been decided for sir nicholas release though he did not know it himself yet and that he would be at home again for advent the prison fever was beginning to cause alarm and it seemed that a good fine would meet the old knight's case better than any other execution of justice so then it was decided and as isabel walked out to the gatehouse after dinner beside anthony with her hand on his horse's neck and as she watched him at last ride down the village green and disappear round behind the church half her sorrow at losing him was swallowed up in the practical certainty that they would meet again before christmas in their old home and not in a stranger's house in the bleak north country on the following thursday sir nicholas weekly letter showed evidence that the good news of his release had begun to penetrate to him his wife longed to tell him all she had heard but so many jealous eyes were on the watch for favoritism that she had been strictly forbidden to pass on her information however there was little need i am in hopes he wrote of keeping christmas in a merrier place than prison i do not mean heaven he hastened to add for fear of alarming his wife good mr jakes tells me that sir john is ill to-day and that he fears the jail fever and if it is the jail fever sweetheart which pray god it may not be for sir john's sake it will be the fourteenth case in the tower and folks say that we shall all be let home again but with another good fine they say to keep us poor and humble and mindful of the queen's majesty her laws however dearest i would gladly pay a thousand pounds if i had them to be home again but there was news at the end of the letter that caused consternation in one or two hearts and sent hubert across storming and almost crying to isabel who was taking a turn in the dusk at sunset she heard his step beyond the hedge quick and impatient and stopped short hesitating and wondering he had behaved to her with extraordinary tact and consideration and she was very conscious of it since her sudden return ten days before from the visit which had been meant to separate them he had not spoken a word to her privately except a shy sentence or two of condolence stammered out with downcast eyes but which from the simplicity and shortness of the words had brought up a sob from her heart she guessed that he knew why she had been sent to northampton and had determined not to take advantage in any way of her sorrow every morning he had disappeared before she came down and did not come back till supper where he sat silent and apart and yet when an occasion offered itself behaved with a quick attentive deference that showed her where his thoughts had been now she stood wondering and timid at that hurried insistent step on the other side of the hedge as she hesitated he came quickly through the doorway and stopped short mistress isabel he said with all his reserve gone and looking at her imploringly but with the old familiar air that she loved have you heard i am to go as soon as my father comes back oh it is a shame his voice was full of tears and his eyes were bright and angry her heart leaped up once and then seemed to cease beating go she said and even as she spoke knew from her own dismay how dear that quiet chivalrous presence was to her yes he went on in the same voice oh i know i should not speak and and especially now at all times but i could not bear it nor that you should think it was my will to go she stood still looking at him may i walk with you a little he said but i must not say much i promised my father and then as they walked he began to pour it out it is some old man in durham 
he said, and I am to see to his estates. My father will not want me here when he comes back, and and it is to be soon. He has had the offer for me, and has written to tell me. There is no choice. She had turned instinctively towards the house, and the high roofs and chimneys were before them, dark against the luminous sky. No, no, said Hubert, laying his hand on her arm, and at the touch she thrilled so much that she knew she must not stay, and went forward resolutely up the steps of the terrace. Ah, let me speak, he said. I have not troubled you much, Mistress Isabel. She hesitated again a moment. In my father's room, he went on, and I will bring the letter. She nodded and passed into the hall without speaking, and turned to Sir Nicholas' study, while Hubert's steps dashed up the stairs to his mother's room. Isabel went in and stood on the hearth in the firelight that glowed and wavered round the room on the tapestry and the prie and the table, where Hubert had been sitting, and the tall shuttered windows, leaning her head against the mantelpiece, doubtful and miserable. "'Listen!' said Hubert, bursting into the room a moment later, with the sheet open in his hand. "'Tell Hubert that Lord Arncliffe needs a gentleman to take charge of his estates. He is too old now himself, and has none to help him. I have had the offer for Hubert, and have accepted it. He must go as soon as I have returned. I am sorry to lose the lad, but since James—' and Hubert broke off. "'I must not read that,' he said. Isabel still stood, stretching her hands out to the fire, and turned a little away from him. "'But what can I say?' went on the lad passionately. "'I must go, and—and and God knows for how long. Five or six years, maybe, and I shall come back and find you, and find you—' and a sob rose up and silenced him. Hubert, she said, turning and looking with a kind of wavering steadiness into his shadowed eyes, and even then noticing the clean-cut features and the smooth curve of his jaw with the firelight on it. You ought not. I know, I know, I promised my father, but there are some things I cannot bear. Of course I do not want you to promise anything, but I thought that if perhaps you could tell me that you thought, that you thought there would be no one else, and that when I come back, Hubert, she said again resolutely, it is impossible, our religions, but I would do anything, I think, besides in five years so much may happen, you might become a catholic or, or or i might come to see that the protestant religion was nearly the same or as true at least or or so much might happen can you not tell me anything before i go a keen ray of hope had pierced her heart as he spoke and she scarcely knew what she said but hubert even if i were to say he seized her hands and kissed them again and again oh god bless you isabel now i can go so happily and i will not speak of it again you can trust me it will not be hard for you she tried to draw her hands away but he still held them tightly in his own strong hands and looked into her face his eyes were shining yes yes i know you have promised nothing i hold you to nothing you are as free as ever to do what you will with me but and he lifted her hands once more and kissed them and dropped them seized his cap and was gone isabel was left alone in a tumult of thought and emotion he had taken her by storm she had not guessed how desperately weak she was towards him until he had come to her like this in a whirlwind of passion and stood trembling and almost crying with the ruddy firelight on his face and his eyes burning out of shadow she felt fascinated still by that mingling of a boy's weakness and sentiment and of a man's fire and purpose 
and she sank down on her knees before the hearth and looked wonderingly at her hands which he had kissed so ardently now transparent and flaming against the light as if with love then as she looked at the red heart of the fire the sudden leaping of her heart quieted and there crept on her a glow of steady desire to lean on the power of this tall young lover of hers she was so utterly alone without him it seemed as if there was no choice left he had come and claimed her in virtue of the master law and she how much had she yielded she had not promised but she had shown evidently her real heart in those half-dozen words and he had interpreted them for her and she dared not in honesty repudiate his interpretation and so she knelt there clasping and unclasping her hands in a whirl of delight and trembling all the bounds of that sober inner life seemed for the moment swept away she almost began to despise its old coldnesses and limitations how shadowy after all was the love of god compared with this burning tide that was bearing her along on its bosom she sank lower and lower into herself among the black draperies clasping those slender hands tightly across her breast suddenly a great log fell with a crash the red glow turned into leaping flames the whole dark room seemed alive with shadows that fled to and fro and she knelt upright quickly and looked around her terrified and ashamed what was she doing here was it so soon then that she was setting aside the will of her father who trusted and loved her so well and who lay out there in the chancel vault ah she had no right here in this room hubert's room now with his cap and whip lying across the papers and the estate book and his knife and the broken jesses on the seat of the chair beside her there was his step overhead again she must be gone before he came back there was high excitement on the estate and in the village a week or two later when the rumour of sir nicholas return was established and the paper had been penned up to the gatehouse stating in lady maxwell's own handwriting that he would be back some time in the week before advent sunday reminiscences were exchanged of the glorious day when the old knight came of age over forty years ago of the sports on the green of the quintain tilting for the gentlefolks and the archery in the meadow behind the church for the vulgar of the high mass and the dinner that followed it it was rumoured that mr hubert and mr piers had already selected the ox that was to be roasted whole and that materials for the bonfire were in process of collection in the wood yard of the home farm sir nicholas letters became more and more emphatically underlined and incoherent as the days went on and lady maxwell less and less willing for isabel to read them but the girl often found the old lady hastily putting away the thin sheets which she had just taken out to read to herself once again on which her dear lord had scrawled down his very heart itself as if his courting of her were all to do again it was not until the saturday morning when the courier rode in through the gatehouse with the news that sir nicholas was to be released that day and would be down if possible before nightfall all the men on the estate were immediately called in and sent home to dress themselves and an escort of a dozen grooms and servants led by hubert and piers rode out at once on the north road with torches ready for kindling to meet the party and bring them home and all other preparations were set forward at once towards eight o'clock lady maxwell was so anxious and restless that isabel slipped out and went down to the gatehouse to look out for herself if there were any signs of the approach of the party she went up to one of the little octagonal towers and looked out towards the green it was a clear starlight night but towards the village all was bathed in the dancing ruddy light of the bonfire it was burning on a little mound at the upper end of the green just below where isabel stood 
and a heavy curtain of smoke drifted westwards as she looked down on it she saw against it the tall black posts of the gigantic jack and the slowly revolving carcass of the ox and round about the stirring crowd of the village folk their figures black on this side luminous on that she could even make out the cassock and square cap of mr bodder as he moved among his flock the rows of houses on either side bright and clear at this end melted away into darkness at the lower end of the green where on the right the church tower rose up blotting out the stars itself just touched with ruddy light and on the top of which like a large star itself burned the torch of the watcher who was looking out towards the north road there was a ceaseless hum of noise from the green pierced by the shrill cries of the children round the glowing mass of the bonfire but there was no disorder as the barrels that had been rolled out of the hall cellars that afternoon still stood untouched beneath the rectory garden wall isabel contrasted in her mind this pleasant human tumult with the angry roaring she had heard from these same country folk a few months before when she had followed lady maxwell out to the rescue of the woman who had injured her and she wondered at these strange souls who attended a protestant service but who were so fierce and so genial in their defence and welcome of a catholic squire as she thought there was a sudden movement of the light on the church tower it tossed violently up and down and a moment later the jubilant clangor of the bells broke out there was a sudden stir in the figures on the green and a burst of cheering rose isabel strained her eyes northwards but the road took a turn beyond the church and she could see nothing but darkness and low-hung stars and one glimmering window she turned instinctively to the house behind her and there was the door flung wide and she could make out the figures of the two ladies against the brightly lit hall beyond wrapped like herself in cloak and hood for the night was frosty and cold as she turned once more she heard the clear rattle of trotting hoofs on the hard road and a glow began to be visible at the lower dark end of the village the cheering rose higher and the bells were all clashing together in melodious discord as in the angle of the road a group of tossing torches appeared then she could make out the horsemen three riding together and the others as escort round them the crowd had poured off the grass on to the road by now and the horses were coming up between two shouting gesticulating lines which closed after them as they went now she could make out the white hair of sir nicholas as he bowed bareheaded right and left and hubert's feathered cap on one side of him and mr boyd's black hat on the other they had passed the bonfire now and were coming up the avenue the crowd still streaming after them and the church tower bellowing rough music overhead isabel leaned out over the battlements and saw beneath her the two old ladies waiting just outside the gate by the horse-block and then she drew back her eyes full of tears for she saw sir nicholas face as he caught sight of his wife there was a sudden silence as the horses drew up and the crowd ceased shouting and when isabel leaned over again sir nicholas was on the horse-block the two ladies immediately behind him and the people pressing forward to hear his voice it was a very short speech and isabel overhead could not catch more than detached phrases of it for the faith my wife and you all home again my son hubert here you and your families the catholic religion the queen's grace god save her majesty then again the cheering broke out and isabel crossed over to see them pass up to the house and to the bright door set wide for them and even as she watched them go up the steps and hubert's figure close behind she suddenly dropped her forehead on to the cold battlement and drew a sharp breath or two for she remembered again what it all meant to him and to herself end of chapter twelve part two chapter one of by what authority by robert hugh benson 
This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Anthony in London. The development of a nation is strangely paralleled by the development of an individual. There comes in both a period of adolescence, of the stirring of new powers, of an increase of strength, of the dawn of new ideals, of the awaking of self-consciousness. Contours become defined and abrupt. Awkward and hasty movements succeed to the grace of childhood, and there is a curious mingling of refinement and brutality, stupidity and tenderness. The will is subject to whims. It is easily roused and not so easily quieted, yet in spite of the attendant discomforts, the whole period is undeniably one of growth. The reign of Elizabeth coincided with this stage in the development of England. The young vigor was beginning to stir, and Hawkins and Drake taught the world that it was so, and that when England stretched herself, catastrophe abroad must follow. She loved finery and feathers and velvet, and to see herself on the dramatic stage, and to sing her love songs there, as a growing maid dresses up and leans on her hand and looks into her own eyes in the mirror. And Marlowe and Green and Shakespeare are witnesses to it. Yet she loved to hang over the arena, too, and watch the bear baiting and see the blood and foam and listen to the snarl of the hounds, as a lad loves sport and things that minister death. Her policy, too, under Elizabeth as her genius, was awkward and ill-considered and capricious, and yet strong and successful in the end, as a growing lad, while he is clumsier, yet manages to leap higher than a year ago, and once more to carry the parallel still further. During the middle period of the reign, while the balance of parties and powers remained much the same, principles and tendencies began to assert themselves more definitely. Just as muscles and sinews begin to appear through the round contour of the limbs of a growing child, thus from fifteen seventy one to fifteen seventy seven while there was no startling reversal of elements in the affairs of england the entire situation became more defined the various parties though they scarcely changed in their mutual relations yet continued to develop swiftly along their respective lines growing more pronounced and less inclined to compromise foreign enmities and expectations became more acute plots against the queen's life more frequent and serious and the countermining of them under walsingham more patient and skilful competition and enterprise in trade more strenuous scottish affairs more complicated movements of revolt and repression in ireland more violent what was true of politics was also true of religious matters for the two were inextricably mingled the puritans daily became more clamorous and intolerant their exercises more turbulent and their demands more unreasonable and one-sided the papists became at once more numerous and more strict and the government measures more stern in consequence the act of seventy one made it no less a crime than high treason to reconcile or be reconciled to the church of rome to give effect to a papal bull to be in possession of any monuments of superstition or to declare the queen a heretic or schismatic the church of england too under the wise guidance of parker had begun to shape her course more and more resolutely along the lines of inclusiveness and moderation to realize herself as representing the religious voice of a nation that was widely divided on matters of faith and to attempt to include within her fold every individual that was not an absolute fanatic in the papist or puritan direction thus in every department in home and foreign politics in art and literature and in religious independence england was rising and shaking herself free the last threads that bound her to the continent 
were snapped by the reformation and she was standing with her soul as she thought awake and free at last conscious of her beauty and her strength ready to step out at last before the world as a dominant and imperious power anthony norris had been arrested like so many others by the vision of this young country of his his mother and mistress who stood there waiting to be served he had left cambridge in seventy three and for three years had led a somewhat aimless life for his guardian allowed him a generous income out of his father's fortune he had stayed with hubert in the north had yawned and stretched himself at great keens had gone to and fro among friends houses and had at last come to the conclusion to which he was aided by a chorus of advisers that he was wasting his time he had begun then to look round him for some occupation and in the final choice of it his early religious training had formed a large element it had kept alive in him a certain sense of the supernatural that his exuberance of physical life might otherwise have crushed and now as he looked about to see how he could serve his country he became aware that her ecclesiastical character had a certain attraction for him he had had indeed an idea of taking orders but he had relinquished this by now though he still desired if he might to serve the national church in some other capacity there was much in the church of england to appeal to her sons if there was a lack of unity in her faith and policy yet that was largely out of sight and her bearing was gallant and impressive she had great wealth great power and great dignity the ancient buildings and revenues were hers the civil power was at her disposal and the queen was eager to further her influence and to protect her bishops from the encroaching power of parliament claiming only for the crown the right to be the point of union for both the secular and ecclesiastical sections of the nation and to stamp by her royal approval or annul by her veto the acts of parliament and convocation alike it seemed then to anthony's eyes that the church of england had a tremendous destiny before her as the religious voice of the nation that was beginning to make itself so dominant in the council of the world and that there was no limit to the influence she might exercise by disciplining the exuberant strength of england and counteracting by her soberness and self-restraint the passionate fanaticism of the latin nations so little by little in place of the shadowy individual that was all that he knew of religion there rose before him the vision of a living church who came forth terrible as an army with banners surrounded by all the loyalty that nationalism could give her with the queen herself as her guardian and great princes and prelates as her supporters while at the wheels of her splendid car walked her hot-blooded chivalrous sons who served her and spread her glories by land and sea not perhaps chiefly for the sake of her spiritual claims but because she was bone of their bone and was no less zealous than themselves for the name and character of england when therefore towards the end of seventy six anthony received the offer of a position in the household of the archbishop of canterbury through the recommendation of the father of one of his cambridge friends he accepted it with real gratitude and enthusiasm the post to which he was appointed was that of gentleman of the horse his actual duties were not very arduous owing to the special circumstances of archbishop grindal and he had a great deal of time to himself briefly they were as follows he had to superintend the yeoman of the horse and see that he kept full accounts of all the horses in stable or at pasture and of all the carriages and harness and the like every morning he had to present himself to the archbishop and receive stable orders for the day and to receive from the yeoman accounts of the stables every month he examined the books of the yeoman before passing them on to the steward his permission too was necessary before any guest's or stranger's horse might be cared for in the lambeth stables he was responsible also for all the men and boys connected with the stable to engage them watch their morals and even the performance of their religious duties 
and if necessary report them for dismissal to the steward of the household in archbishop parker's time this had been a busy post as the state observed at lambeth and croydon was very considerable but grindal was of a more retiring nature disliking as was said lordliness and although still the household was an immense affair in its elaborateness and splendour beyond almost any but royal households of the present day still anthony's duties were far from heavy the archbishop indeed at first dispensed with this office altogether and concentrated all the supervision of the stable on the yeoman and anthony was the first and only gentleman of the horse that archbishop grendel employed the disgrace and punishment under which the archbishop fell so early in his archiepiscopate made this particular post easier than it would even otherwise have been as fewer equipages were required when the archbishop was confined to his house and the establishment was yet further reduced ordinarily then his duties were over by eleven o'clock except when special arrangements were to be made he rose early waited upon the archbishop by eight o'clock received his orders for the day then interviewed the yeoman sometimes visited the stables to receive complaints and was ready by half-past ten to go to the chapel for the morning prayers with the rest of the household at eleven he dined at the steward's table in the great hall with the other principal officers of the household the chaplain the secretaries and the gentlemen ushers with guests of lesser degree this great hall with its two entrances at the lower end near the gateway its magnificent hammer-beam roof its dais its stained glass was a worthy place of entertainment and had been the scene of many great feasts and royal visits in the times of previous archbishops in favour with the sovereign and of a splendid banquet at the beginning of grendel's occupancy of the sea now however things were changed there were seldom many distinguished persons to dine with the disgraced prelate and he himself preferred too to entertain those who could not repay him again after the precept of the gospel and besides the provision for the numerous less important guests who dined daily at lambeth a great tub was set at the lower end of the hall as it had been in parker's time and every day after dinner under the steward's direction was filled with food from the tables which was afterwards distributed at the gate to poor people of the neighbourhood after dinner anthony's time was often his own until the evening prayers at six followed by supper again spread in the hall it was necessary for him always to sleep in the house unless leave was obtained from the steward this gentleman mr john scott an esquire took a fancy to anthony and was indulgent to him in many ways and anthony had as a matter of fact little difficulty in coming and going as he pleased so soon as his morning duties were done lambeth house had been lately restored by parker and was now a very beautiful and well-kept place among other repairs and buildings he had re-roofed the great hall that stood just within morton's gateway he had built a long pier into the thames where the barge could be entered easily even at low tide he had rebuilt the famous summer-house of cranmer's in the garden besides doing many sanitary alterations and repairs and the house was well kept up in grindal's time anthony soon added a great affection and tenderness to the awe that he felt for the archbishop who was almost from the first a pathetic and touching figure when anthony first entered on his duties in november seventy six he found the archbishop in his last days of freedom and good favour with the queen elizabeth he soon learnt from the gossip of the household was as determined to put down the puritan prophesyings as the popish services for both alike tended to injure the peace she was resolved to maintain rumours were flying to and fro the archbishop was continually going across the water to confer with his friends and the lords of the council and messengers came and went all day and it was soon evident that the archbishop did not mean to yield it was said that his grace had sent a letter to her majesty bidding her not to meddle with what did not concern her telling her that she too would one day have to render account before christ's tribunal 
and warning her of God's anger if she persisted. Her Majesty had sworn like a trooper, a royal page said one day as he lounged over the fire in the guard room, and had declared that if she was like Oseus and Ahab and the rest, as Grindel had said she was, she would take care that he at least should be like Micaiah the son of Imla, before she had done with him. Then it began to leak out that Elizabeth was sending her commands to the bishops direct instead of through their metropolitan and as the days went by it became more and more evident that disgrace was beginning to shadow lambeth the barges that drew up at the water gate were fewer as summer went on and the long tables in hall were more and more deserted even the archbishop himself seemed silent and cast down anthony used to watch him from his window going up and down the little walled garden that looked upon the river with his hands clasped behind him and his black habit gathered up in them and his chin on his breast he would be longer than ever too in chapel after the morning prayer and the company would wait and wonder in the ante-room till his grace came in and gave the signal for dinner and at last the blow fell on one day in june anthony who had been on a visit to isabel at great keynes returned to lambeth in time for morning prayer and dinner just before the gates were shut by the porter having ridden up early with a couple of grooms there seemed to him to be an air of constraint abroad as the guests and members of the household gathered for dinner there were no guests of high dignity that day and the archbishop sat at his own table silent and apart anthony from his place at the steward's table noticed that he ate very sparingly and that he appeared even more preoccupied and distressed than usual his short-sighted eyes kind and brown surrounded by wrinkles from his habit of peering closely at everything seemed full of sadness and perplexity and his hand fumbled with his bread continually anthony did not like to ask anything of his neighbours as there were one or two strangers dining at the steward's table that day and the moment dinner was over and grace had been said and the archbishop retired with his little procession preceded by a white wand an usher came running back to tell master norris that his grace desired to see him at once in the inner cloister anthony hastened round through the court between the hall and the river and found the archbishop walking up and down in his black habit with the round flapped hat that as a puritan he preferred to the square headdress of the more ecclesiastically minded clergy still looking troubled and cast down continually stroking his dark forked beard and talking to one of his secretaries anthony stood at a little distance at the open side of the court near the river cap in hand waiting till the archbishop should beckon him the two went up and down in the shade of the open court outside the cloisters where the pump stood and where the pulpit had been erected for the queen's famous visit to his predecessor when she had sat in a gallery over the cloister and heard the chaplain's sermon on the north rose up the roof of the chapel the cloisters themselves were poor buildings little more than passages with a continuous row of square windows running along them the height of a man's head after a few minutes the secretary left the archbishop with an obeisance and hastened into the house through the cloister and presently the archbishop after a turn or two more with the same grave air peered towards anthony and then called him anthony immediately came towards him and received orders that half a dozen horses with grooms should be ready as soon as possible who were to receive orders from mr richard frampton the secretary and that three or four horses more were to be kept saddled till seven o'clock that evening in case further messages were wanted and i desire you mr norris said the archbishop to let the men under your charge know that their master is in trouble with the queen's grace and that they can serve him best by being prompt and obedient anthony bowed to the archbishop and was going to withdraw but the archbishop went on i will tell you he said for your private ear only at present that i have received an order this day from my lords of the council bidding me to keep to my house for six months and telling me that i am sequestered by the queen's desire 
I know not how this will end, but the cause is that I will not do her grace's will in the matter of the exercises, as I wrote to tell her so, and I am determined, by God's grace, not to yield in this thing, but to govern the charge committed to me as he gives me light. That is all, Mr. Norris. The whole household was cast into real sorrow by the blow that had fallen at last on the master. He was loving and grateful to the servants, and was free and liberal in domestic matters, and it needed only a hint that he was in trouble for his officers and servants to do their utmost for him. Anthony's sympathy was further aroused by the knowledge that the papists, too, hated the old man and longed to injure him. There had been a great increase of Catholics this year. The Archbishop of York had reported that a more stiff-necked, willful, or obstinate people did he never hear of, and from Hereford had come a lament that conformity itself was a mockery, as even the papists that attended church were a distraction when they got there. And John Harley was instanced as reading so loud upon his latin popish primer that he understands not that he troubles both minister and people in november matters were so serious that the archbishop felt himself obliged to take steps to chastise the recusants and in december came the news of the execution of cuthbert main at launceston in cornwall how much the catholics resented this against the archbishop was brought to anthony's notice a day or two later he was riding back for morning prayer after an errand in battersea one frosty day and had just come in sight of morton's gateway when he observed a man standing by it who turned and ran on hearing the horse's footsteps past lambeth church and disappeared in the direction of the meadows behind essex house anthony checked his horse doubtful whether to follow or not but decided to see what it was that the man had left pinned to the door he rode up and detached it and found it was a violent and scurrilous attack upon the archbishop for his supposed share in the death of the two papists it denounced him as a bloody pseudo minister compared him to pilate and bade him look to his congregation of lewd and profane persons that he named the church of england for that god would avenge the blood of his saints speedily upon their murderers anthony carried it into the hall and after showing it to mr scott put it indignantly into the fire the steward raised his eyebrows why so master norris he asked why said anthony sharply you would not have me frame it and show to my lord i am not sure said the other if you desire to injure the papists such foul nonsense is their best condemnation it is best to keep evidence against a traitor not destroy it besides we might have caught the knave and now we cannot he added looking at the black shrivelling sheet half regretfully it is a mystery to me said anthony how there can be papists why they hate england said the steward briefly as the bell rang for morning prayer as anthony followed him along the gallery he thought half guiltily of sir nicholas and his lady and wondered whether that was true of them but he had no doubt that it was true of catholics as a class they had ceased to be english the causes of the pope and the queen were irreconcilable and so the whole incident added more fuel to the hot flame of patriotism and loyalty that burnt so bright in the lad's soul but it was fanned yet higher by a glimpse he had of court life and he owed it to mary corbett whom he had only seen momentarily in public once or twice and never to speak to her since her visit to great Keynes over six years ago he had blushed privately and bitten his lip a good many times in the interval when he thought of his astonishing infatuation and yet the glamour had never wholly faded and his heart quickened perceptibly when he opened a note one day brought by a royal groom that asked him to come that very afternoon if he could to whitehall palace 
where Mistress Corbett would be delighted to see him and renew their acquaintance. As he came, punctual to the moment, into the gallery overlooking the tilt-yard, the afternoon sun was pouring in through the oriel window, and the yard beyond seemed all a haze of gold and light and dust. He heard an exclamation as he paused, dazzled, and the servant closed the door behind him, and there came forward to him in the flood of glory the same resplendent figure, all muslin and jewels, that he remembered so well, with the radiant face, looking scarcely older, with the same dancing eyes and scarlet lips. All the old charm seemed to envelop him in a moment as he saluted her with all the courtesy of which he was capable. Ah, she cried, how happy I am to see you again, those dear days at Great Keynes and she took both his hands with such ardour that poor anthony was almost forced to think that he had never been out of her thoughts since how can i serve you mistress corbett he asked serve me why by talking to me and telling me of the country what does the lad mean come and sit here she said and drew him to the window seat anthony looked out into the shining haze of the tilt-yard someone with a long pole was struggling violently on the back of a horse jerking the reins and cursing audibly ha oh, look at that fool said mary he thinks his horse as great a dolt as himself chris chris she screamed through her hands you sodden ass be quieter with the poor beast soothe him soothe him he doesn't know what you want of him with your foul temper and your pole going like a windmill about his ears the cursing and jerking ceased and a red furious face with thick black beard and hair looked up but before the rider could speak mary went on again there now chris he is as quiet as a sheep again now take him at it what does he want asked anthony i can scarcely see for the dust why he's practising at the quintain ah oh, ah oh, she cried out again as the quintain was missed and swung around with a hard buffet on the man's back as he tore past going to market chris you've got a sturdy shepherd behind you ba ba black sheep who's that asked anthony as the tall horseman as if driven by the storm of contumely from the window disappeared towards the stable why that's chris hatton whom the queen calls her sheep and he's as silly as one too with his fool's face and his bleat and his great eyes he trots about after her grace too like a pet lamb bah i'm sick of him that's enough of the ass tell me about isabel then they fell to talking about isabel and mary eyed him as he answered her questions then she isn't a papist yet she asked anthony's face showed such consternation that she burst out laughing there 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 she cried no harm's done then that tall lad who was away last time i was there well i suppose he's not turned protestant anthony's face was still more bewildered why my dear lad she said where are your eyes mistress corbett he burst out at last i do not know what you mean hubert has been in durham for years there is no talk and he stopped mary's face became sedate again well well she said i always was a tattler seems i'm wrong again forgive me master anthony anthony was indeed astonished at her fantastic idea of course he knew that hubert had once been fond of isabel but that was years ago when they had been all children together why he reflected he too had been foolish once and he blushed a little then they went on to talk of great keynes sir nicholas and mr stuart's arrest and death and mary asked anthony to excuse her interest in such matters but papistry had always been her religion and what could a poor girl do but believe what she was taught then they went on to speak of more recent affairs and mary made him describe to her his life at lambeth and everything he did from the moment he got up to the moment he went to bed again and whether the archbishop was a kind master and how long they spent at prayers 
and how many courses they had at dinner and anthony grew more and more animated and confidential she was so friendly and interested and pretty as she leaned towards him and questioned and listened and the faint scent of violet from her dress awakened his old memories of her and then at last she approached the subject on which she had chiefly wished to see him which was that he should speak to the steward at lambeth on behalf of a young man who was to be dismissed it seemed from the archbishop's service because his sister had lately turned papist and fled to a convent abroad it was a small matter and anthony readily promised to do his best and if necessary to reproach the archbishop himself and mistress corbett was profusely grateful they had hardly done talking of the matter when a trumpet blew suddenly somewhere away behind the building they were in mary held up a white finger and put her head on one side that will be the ambassador she said anthony looked at her interrogatively why you country lad she said come and see she jumped up and he followed her down the gallery and along through interminable corridors and antechambers and up and down the stairs of this enormous palace and anthony grew bewildered and astonished as he went at the doors on all sides and the roofs that ranged themselves every way as he looked out and at last mary stopped at a window and pointed out the courtyard beneath was alive with colour and movement in front of the entrance opposite waited the great gilded state carriage and another was just driving away on one side a dozen ladies on grey horses were drawn up to follow behind the queen when she should come out and a double row of liveried servants were standing bareheaded round the empty carriage the rest of the court was filled with spanish and english nobles mounted with their servants on foot all alike in splendid costumes the spaniards with rich chains about their necks and tall broad-brimmed hats decked with stones and pearls and the englishmen in feathered buckled caps and short cloaks thrown back two or three trumpeters stood on the steps of the porch anthony did not see much state at lambeth and the splendour and gaiety of this seething courtyard exhilarated him and he stared down at it all fascinated while mary corbett poured out a caustic commentary there is the fat fool chris again all red with his tilting i would like to baw at him again but i dare not with all these foreign folk there is lester that tall man with the bald forehead in the cap with the red feather on the white horse behind the carriage he always keeps close to the queen he's the enemy of your prelate master anthony you know that is oxford just behind him on the chestnut yes look well at him he is the prince of the tilt yard none can stand against him you would say he was at his ninepins when he rides against them all and he can do more than tilt these sweet-washed gloves and she flapped an embroidered pair before anthony these he brought to england god bless and reward him for it she added fervently i do not see burley eh but he is old and gouty these days and loves a cushion and a chair and a bit of flannel better than to kneel before her grace you know she allows him to sit when he confers with her but then she is ever prone to show mercy to bearded persons ah there is dear sidney that is a sweet soul but what does he do here among the stones and mortar when he has the beeches of penshurst to walk beneath he is not so wise as i thought him but i must say i grow weary of his nymphs and his airs of olympus and for myself i do not see that flora and phoebus and maya and the rest are a great gain instead of our lady and saint christopher and the court of heaven but then i am a papist and not a heathen and therefore blind and superstitious is that not so master anthony and there is maitland beside him with the black velvet cap and the white feather and his cross eyes and mouth now i wish he were at penshurst or bath or better still at jericho for it is further off i cannot bear that fellow why sussex is going on the water too i see now what brings him here i should have thought his affairs gave him enough to think of 
there he is with his groom behind him on the other chestnut i am astonished at him he is all for this french marriage you know so you may figure to yourself mendoza's love for him they will be like two cats together on the barge spitting and snarling softly at one another her grace loves to balance folk like that first one stretches his claws and then the other then one arches his back and snarls and the other scratches his face for him and then when all is flying fur and blasphemy off slips her grace and does what she will it was an astonishing experience for anthony he had stepped out from his workaday life among the grooms and officers and occasional glimpses of his lonely old master into an enchanted region where great personages whose very names were luminous with fame now lived and breathed and looked cheerful or sullen before his very eyes and one who knew them in their daily life stood by him and commented and interpreted them for him he listened and stared dazed with the strangeness of it all mistress corbett was proceeding to express her views upon the foreign element that formed half the pageant when the shrill music broke out again in the palace and the trumpeters on the steps took it up and a stir and bustle began then out of the porch began to stream a procession like a river of colour and jewels pouring from the foot of the carved and windowed wall and eddying in a tumbled pool about the great gilt carriage ushers and footmen and nobles and ladies and pages in bewildering succession anthony pressed his forehead to the glass as he watched with little exclamations and mary watched him amused and interested by his enthusiasm and last moved the great canopy bending and swaying under the doorway and beneath it like two gorgeous butterflies at the sight of whom all the standing world fell on its knees came the pale elizabeth with her auburn hair and the brown-faced mendoza side by side and entered the carriage with the five plumes atop and the caparisoned horses that stamped and tossed their jingling heads the yard was already emptying fast en route for chelsea stairs and as soon as the two were seated the shrill trumpets blew again and the halberdiers moved off with the carriage in the midst the great nobles going before and the ladies behind the later comers mounted as quickly as possible as their horses were brought in from the stable entrance and clattered away and in five minutes the yard was empty except for a few sentries at their posts and a servant or two lounging at the doorway and as anthony still stared at the empty pavement and the carpeted steps far away from the direction of the abbey came the clear call of the horns to tell the loyal folk that the queen was coming it was a great inspiration for anthony he had seen world powers incarnate below him in the glittering rustling figure of the queen and the dark-eyed courtly ambassador in his orders and jewels at her side there they had sat together in one carriage the huge fiery realm of the south whose very name was redolent with passion and adventure and boundless wealth and the little self-contained northern kingdom now beginning to stretch its hands and quiver all along its tingling sinews and veins with fresh adolescent life and anthony knew that he was one of the cells of this young organism and that in him as well as in elizabeth and this sparkling creature at his side ran the fresh red blood of england they were all one in the possession of a common life and his heart burned as he thought of it after he had parted from mary he rode back to westminster and crossed the river by the horse ferry that plied there and even as he landed and got his beast with a deal of stamping and blowing off the echoing boards on to the clean gravel again there came down the reaches of the river the mellow sound of music across a mile of water mingled with the deep rattle of oars and sparkles of steel and colour glittered from the far-away royal barges in the autumn sunshine and the lad thought with wonder how the two great powers so savagely at war upon the salt sea were at peace here sitting side by side on silken cushions and listening to the same trumpets of peace upon the flowing river End of chapter one